Good morning. Uh, it is really a delight to be here. I mean, to be asked to come to uh, Vegas and uh, hang out with uh, not only the best event crew ever, um, but all of you. And then on top of that, to get to interview somebody who is a personal hero of mine. I feel very lucky this morning. I also just want to say that was a great talk, uh, really bringing the truth, wonderful. And the next talk is also going to be great after us. I happen to be a very proud and happy customer of uh, Nicole Sanchez and Vi Consulting, so also blessed to be part of this amazing lineup of people. Um, so I th wanted to take probably a little bit longer than one normally does to introduce our speaker um, uh, by way of how I met her. So. I, uh, this was you know, back in 2011-12, I was sort of wandering around to various local governments around the country who were all trying to put up open data portals. And then I went to Louisville where Beth Niblock had just put one up and she was very no-nonsense about it. And all of the questions that folks had about what would happen when you put up all this data, she said, well, we're gonna find out. Uh, and very quickly, you know, uh, that, that open data portal in fact included salaries for all of the municipal employees in Louisville Metro. And yes, there were some bugs that came out and they worked them out and they got to a better outcome. And I said, wow, this woman really has a boldness to her that I just love. And she's um, showing other people how to do it. So I became a big fan. Um, we asked her to write uh, a chapter for a book that we did called Beyond Transparency um, about not just getting the data out there, but using the data to drive continuous improvement. And uh, she and Teresa Reno Weber were great leaders in that and inspired many other cities to do the same. Uh, and so along came our Code for America fellows. We decided to send a team of three of our, our folks doing a year of service to Louisville. They looked bright and shiny when we sent them down there. That's them outside of our office. And then uh, Beth promptly threw them into jail. <laughs> uh, she actually had this team of um, bright and shiny uh, developers and designers and product managers um, work on something that was so critical to Louisville at the time, which was overcrowding in the jails. They built a, uh, uh, a, a jail dashboard to monitor uh, who was in and who was out and make sure that they didn't get into an overcrowding situation. Other cities adopted it because it was open source. Um, and again, my uh, respect and affection for Beth just grew. And it grew uh, to the point where when I happened to take a year off and be in the Obama White House and Detroit was um, having a lot of trouble, um, someone in the office came by and said, who should we send um, from other municipalities to go help Detroit sort out their situation? And I said, you got to send Beth because she really is going to take the bull by the horns. And she got then invited to go along with this great group of other um, civic uh, uh, technology leaders to Detroit. And that resulted in her becoming uh, the CIO of Detroit. Uh, I think there were some steps in there I missed, but somehow then she was uh, asked to sort of uproot herself from Louisville, Kentucky, and move to Detroit. And um, that's really the story that she and I are going to focus on today. Um, I haven't talked to her much since then, so this is a great chance for me to catch up with her. But the timing of this is fantastic, because she went in just as Detroit was moving into bankruptcy, and on Monday, the state, uh, Detroit emerged from state oversight. This is a huge, huge milestone. And it's not just a legal and administrative milestone here. We really see a city, as the New York Times said, I think this was just two days ago, Detroit was crumbling, now it's reviving. The municipal infrastructure, the IT infrastructure that they've needed to run the city is an enormous part of that. And that's why I'm so excited to have Beth here to share with you some of the brave and wonderful things that she and her team has done to help bring back Detroit. So please help me welcome mm, Beth Niblock. Um, so thank you so much for coming and doing this. Well, thank you for doing this. And thank you for what you've done in Detroit. Let's start with what it was like. So you get pulled out of Louisville where you've done all this amazing stuff, and they say, come, you're going to help with this situation. Mm -hmm. What do you find on the ground in terms of the state of Detroit and also the, straight, uh, the state of the IT infrastructure? Well, it, you know, the, nothing was really fundamentally working in Detroit. So we had about 40,000 vacant and abandoned homes that we needed to deal with. There weren't street, working streetlights, which 
you don't realize how much you like streetlights until you live in a city that they don't work. Um, trash wasn't being picked up, and Detroit was entering bankruptcy, so the emergency manager was put in place by the governor, and um, he was starting to take us through that bankruptcy um, process. Mayor Duggan was elected. Um, he was a write-in candidate. He had gotten kicked off the ballot uh, for not being two weeks short of a residency requirement, but he won as a write-in candidate. And so the, the elected officials, both the city council and the mayor, only had the power that the emergency manager allowed him to have, or the council to have as well. So when we came as the group to um, Detroit, uh, we met with a lot of the folks within city government, but the thing that really caught our eye is that Detroit had a burgeoning civic tech community because the government wasn't functioning, they, they did it. So groups like Data Driven Detroit or uh, Loveland, which is a private company, Allied Media, Detroit Digital Justice Program, Code for America Brigade were all there doing things that normally a government would be able to do. So Data Driven Detroit was actually paid by a foundation to help the city get data out of its own kind of archaic systems that had been in place since the 70s. So it was that that really caught all of our eye and said, you know, this is nuggets of goodness everywhere in Detroit. And I think yeah. if we can get city government working that in combination with our partners in the private sector and in the philanthropy sector and the civic tech sector, we can really change things. It's, it's, it's great to start with that because it is so important and we see this everywhere that the, the you know, when, the, when revitalization is part done by the people who need mm -hmm. it revitalized, mm -hmm. it's so much stronger and it's so much more resilient. Absolutely. Um, but you were in a place where you didn't have staff or you that had the skills to get that data out of those systems. You had very few staff, if I right. recall. Right, so we had about 60 team members. It was very decentralized. More than half of the folks were, were contractors um, because literally my senior network engineers were making, and, and I'm talking network engineers with with 20 years experience, were making $50,000. So they had been cut every year because Detroit's finances were getting worse. And so part of what we did under this kind of emergency manager structure is that we actually consolidated all IT, so all of IT, public safety IT and normal core business IT got consolidated. We uh, went from 60 people to 136. We redid all the job descriptions, and we were able to benchmark against the, the people that we actually compete with, the companies that we compete with in Southeast Michigan. So for, for my team members, hiring new team members, I'm competing against Ford, Quicken Loans, uh, Fiat Chrysler, GM. And so it, we really needed to do things. So we really, and I give the mayor and, and the council a lot of credit for saying we need to be competitive. And how did you get them? I mean, uh, you were competitive, but there's yeah. got to be some element of, of, uh, of civic duty here when you're doing that recruiting. It, it, it <laughs> is. And, you know, what, that's what's so exciting. There were a lot of Detroiters who, for whatever reasons, didn't feel like they could stay in Detroit. Mm -hmm. And when all this happened, they felt called to come back. And so there was... Um, uh, I, I feel like I can change, help change, and be a part of the change in my hometown. And so that was a powerful, powerful call to service. Yeah. Uh, when we, and I think that call to service is happening more and more. So I know uh, many of you are in, in the audience are in government. And um, I want to just start by thanking all of you and Absolutely. thanking you for the work that you do. Um, you, we talked a little bit about your first project and why that was important. Um, in fact, you told me it was your favorite project. Right. Why was that? What is that? And why was that important? So coming out of, you know, when you go to a city that's going through bankruptcy, um, you understand you're going to be disposed by all the creditors and you have to end up testifying in federal court. And because there was a huge amount of money dedicated in the plan of adjustment for the bankruptcy to go to IT. So we had about $90 million worth of projects right off the bat that needed to be done in the first three years because they were counting on us being able to put in systems where we actually knew what people 
needed to pay for their taxes and we could we could collect the taxes successfully. So, so just stop on that for a second. So you had you come in, you have a system where you literally don't even know what people owe in taxes. It, it was rough estimates. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, so we, we were able to replace those systems, and now we know. Uh, for the Good. better or the worse of it, you know, I serve on a board, and they're like, those damn Detroit things. And they, I know now I get these bills, and they're regular, and I can't dispute them. And, uh, <laughs> so there's a good and a bad side to that. That's good. That's so, helpful. Okay, so, so, you, so you had that situation. A lot. But so you have to understand we were, were 85 or 90 percent of my fleet of computers were Windows XP or older. So um, we couldn't patch them. The network wasn't really working. The mail wasn't, the email wasn't being delivered. So we had to go from a fundamental place of executing on basics. So my favorite project was rolling out new PCs. And so when we met with the vendors who helped us do that, we were also moving from Novell over to Active Directory. And we said, look, this is the first. <laughs> Did I mention we use, still use group buys? Um, <laughs> so, um, so I said, this is the first project that's going to happen out of bankruptcy. And it is absolutely going to set the tone for everything else we do. And we have to be, we have to do this well. And so rolling out the new PCs and we did nobody, I mean, they were using Office 2003. Um, so we jumped them to 2013. You know, all the training that's involved. So we, we had made such fun and had, people had selfie sticks and they were doing all kinds of, of good things and it really set the tone for the, our customers, our internal customers, that we could do things, but more importantly, it gave my team the confidence that they could really see once they had the money, because they were doing miraculous things with no money. Once they were able to do that, it, it really set the tone for things to come. Yeah, that's it. Just a sort of a shift in in mindset and Absolutely. in confidence. But so how but so how did the rest of municipal government react? How 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 were your customers about it? What did it what create change did it create in them? Well, they they were thrilled, but they also became um, uh, so it, it was great. I mean, you could actually open a document that you one receive the document and two you could open it. It was great, um, and two <laughs> it created an accountability. Um, uh, so uh, my administrative assistant said to me, yeah, you know they're talking about you. They're like, oh, if some crazy lady on an elevator with a s southern accent, if you say, like, I didn't get something via email or you couldn't open something, she follows you to your desk and she's going to figure <laughs> out with her team, like, what it was because it was a really acceptable answer of I never got it or I couldn't open, open it. And so it actually took accountability back out. But the bigger, th the bigger thing is it gave... The, t the people who actually serve the people who will pay us, the, our Detroiters, the tools to be able to do what they need to do. Yeah. And, you know, this is a passion that, that Beth and I share. You know, um, we, this, this neglect of the machinery yeah. of government, of the infrastructure that we need to run things like cities is a choice that we've made, and we need to make different choices. Right. Um, there's a, you had, I think, so many different legacy systems yes. in there that were... Um, really will long past their expiration date. Um, is there one in particular you'd like to talk about? Well, we're actually still using it. It would be a payroll system that pays 80% um, of the city of Detroit uh, people that were, were, it was put in in 1978. Uh, it's run on, uh, at that point in time, X, uh, XGen uh, 2.0, they're on 10.0. Um, and I had one guy, Mr. Butler, um, who could have retired, who was just an incredibly um, wonderful and lovely man, who stayed because he knew that the police don't get paid um, beca if, because he was one of two people that knew how to expand the database and actually make it run and reissue, uh, you know, redo things if the payroll didn't run correctly. And um, unfortunately, um, Mr. Butler died um, partway through all this, we, we did a lift and shift and put it on more modern technology, but we're in the process of putting in a new uh, payroll and time and tennis system. But, you know, when you think that 80% of the city got paid on a system that was put in in 1978 uh, that has hundreds of thousands of lines of codes and you can't figure out, and then so you do new bargaining union agreements, and then you can't, f you have these, all these wild unintended consequences of changing the code. 
I'm curious, um, I don't know how well we can see you. Yeah, I can kind of see you. How many of you work in an organization that has a situation like that, that is so precarious and so outdated? You raise your hands? Like Any, anybody? Like Not very many, interesting, yeah. How, and how many of you are in government? <laughs> <laughs> Same two. Or in that. Uh, uh, we were, I don't know if any, uh, I know many of you this morning were in John O'Din's session. Um, John is someone I worked with, uh, well, we were at different times in federal government and then together at Code for America. Um, but he did some time at, uh, at the VA where we had, you know, there was just sort of an endless uh, uh, set of stories about things like this that were just dependent on one human being. And in many cases, the sort of common thread was the person just wanted to retire, but was staying there because he, in both cases, these two cases were both a he, knew that if he left, it would, you know, it would materially damage the organization, but not only that, the, the, the people that it was trying to serve, right. in, in John's case, veterans. And that's the situation we find ourselves in today. I mean, it's, it's kind of shocking. So you had how many projects like this? So I, I brought, it's because I can't remember them all. I'm getting a little older and they're running together. So we completely redid our network infrastructure. We put in backup systems. We lifted and shifted off a mainframe. We put in a new computer aided dispatch for 911. We opened a new 911 call center. We put in new records management systems for police, fire, and EMS. We put in a new jail management system. We put in a real-time crime center. Uh, we have dumping cameras, we have integrated body cameras within vehicle cameras for police. We, um, so back in the bankruptcy days when they toned a fire station, they put, you get it via fax and they put pop cans on the end of the fax machine and that's how they knew they were getting paged. So we put in page out systems, put in new tax systems, new law systems, new financial management systems, electronic plan review systems, and then um, we're in flight with a new uh, HR payroll system, uh, all the technology in our bus systems being replaced, and um, we are launching a new website in a couple of months, and I think we'll be the first website to have a majority of it human translated, so we will have Spanish, Arabic, and Bengali as well. Um, and we did, the big thing for the citizens is, so Detroiters um, are not, we have a low connectivity rate for broadband and we also have a low mobility rate. So a lot of Detroiters don't, are dependent on public transit. So it was very difficult and they, it would take days for people to come downtown to stand in line that wrapped around the building to pay. We have winter and summer taxes to pay their taxes. Now we actually have machines. We're also a very cash-based society. So we have machines in uh, CVSs that where you can pay all of your city bills at one time. So, um, and our collection rates have, have gone up significantly. But the bigger thing is it, it it helps Detroiters where they are. We don't make them come downtown. And we're also very text dependent. So things that we do around demolitions, telling people, hey, we're gonna demo in your area, keep your kids inside, close your doors and windows. Um, whether it's warming centers, uh, the bus that Code for America came in and did, you know, where's my bus? And so we've been able to reach out to people in whatever way they wanna interact with us. And we have things like, you know, Improve Detroit, which is a smart home phone app where we've got 100,000, uh, you know, r issues resolved. But all that's out on the public data, open data site. See what I mean? That's kind of a miraculous set of things. <laughs> Everyone else get busy. That's your list, right? Well, and, and so I do have to say, you know, when you have the unwavering support of your mayor and, you know, uh, sometimes there's a tension between the CFO and the CIO. Um, I have a true partner in uh, John Hill, who's the CFO for the city of Detroit, hashtag best work spouse ever. <laughs> and um, my team, who I will... Um, put up against anybody. Yeah. The heart and soul and dedication and professionalism that these um, team members bring every day, I'm humbled to work bes beside them. Yeah, and I have the same experience with many folks who choose to work in government. Um, we don't have t much time left, and I want to save a bit at the end um, for sort of your sure. advice for folks in the crowd, but um, first advice and thoughts on the vendor ecosystem and what, yeah. what, what do you want to tell vendors? 
Well, um, <laughs> got a lot to say wow. um, in two minutes and 47 seconds, so it'll be quick. Um, we, we are your partner, and you need to consider us your partner. We, don't, we will go the journey with you, but you have to be respectful. We, we are not stupid, and um, we need to be in a better dialogue, and we need you to be, do better, faster, iterative development. I don't mind getting something that works, but I need all these other features. You have to commit to that development time frame, and then we have to work on that together. And do you think the vendor... And you have to be open. And is it changing? A bit. Not fast enough. Yeah. Not fast enough. The iterations need to come faster. The iterations need to come faster. You know, big corporations, we know you have large development teams. And so, you know, for, for releases to take two and three years to fix a significant problem that we have is not acceptable. Yeah. And as uh, Marco Party said yesterday, you know, some of these things that, you know, when you talk about the word mission critical, um, we've worked, for instance, the state of California on a child welfare system. Mm -hmm. You think about what that mission is. It's a kid who needs to, a new home to live in for a while because the kid isn't safe. That's the definition of mission critical, and all these systems are like that, and that's why it's so important. So please, please, listen to Beth. <laughs> um, so uh, what advice do you have for, for anybody in this, in this field? Consider coming to government for a bit. Um, you will get more experience doing things. So my portfolio is we've got 25 different distinct businesses. So I've got police, fire, and EMS, but I also have the health department. Um, I have animal control. So the types of projects and the breadth of projects. So you're talking with animal control. How do we track dogs that are loose? How do we do mobility? How do we do, you know, commercial corridor development? So we're, we're actually buying Trimble units with LIDAR on it and doing all of our own uh, imagery because we, we can. So, and we need to because Detroit's so dynamic. So I think come and you will get an experience of a lifetime and then back to businesses because somebody spent a couple years in government don't devalue the service that they've done by going there because they're gonna come up with things that you'll never think of um, and approaches that are just different that will do nothing but add value to your business. We started recruiting into federal government with the line, you're going to learn more in a week here than you would in a year. And we were recruiting largely actually out of, out of uh, uh, Google and Silicon Valley companies and they, they bought it because it's really true. Yeah. Well, I will echo that and I will say that uh, not only do the citizens of Detroit owe you a solid thank you <laughs> for what you've done, but I think um, everyone in government and everyone in this country who cares about our city is working. Thank you for doing this and thank you all my for honor. listening. Thank you.